Zoom in, Zoom. I am so excited tonight to have a panel of some dynamic Zimbabwean doctors, all based in the USA, in the front lines against COVID-19. I have Dr. Jabu, Dr. Jerry, Dr. Fari, Dr. Mona Lisa, and Dr. Nyembi. And we thought it might be a good idea to give some relatable accounts of COVID-19, what it's been doing to populations, how our doctors have been responding, and actually we have the distinct, I guess, advantage of doctors who've actually suffered from the disease as well and can talk to what it's been like to go through the trauma that is COVID-19. I'm going to start with you, Mona Lisa, because I think that you're a face and Balbians are increasingly becoming familiar with. You suffered from COVID-19. Can you just talk us through your experience? Suffering COVID for, from the physician perspective wasn't really much because I think most of the frontline health workers did go through it knowingly or not knowingly. I probably was one of the unknowing sort of victims leading up to everything. Um, I mean, I made a very lengthy video describing some of my symptoms. And I guess the purpose of me sort of talking about that was just to sort of give people an idea of how not cookie cutter some of the symptoms were. I know some of my colleagues on the call probably also had their own experiences with COVID. My symptoms were mostly gastrointestinal, so like abdominal pain, generalized weakness, which could have easily been attributed to all of the excessive working that I was doing, and a very incognito symptom that we only found out later that, you know, I couldn't smell. And that was sort of one of the things that tipped me off to maybe I should get tested. Otherwise, without that, I probably wouldn't have. So there's a lot of information out there in the world now of different symptoms. And I'm sure other people other than me have similar experiences as well. Well, I will jump in and say it's difficult to say whether you did or not because of the atypical presentation of symptoms from a lot of people who were um, mildly symptomatic or asymptomatic and infected. Quote unquote. And that's been the characteristic of this novel coronavirus. Its novelty is um, not only because of pulmonary symptoms, but also the wide variety of presentations of people from mildly symptomatic to severely ill and the fatality of it all. So it's hard to say on this panel if anyone has suffered from coronavirus. Thankfully, we're all healthy and we're sitting here to talk about it. But it's a possibility that any one of us could have been infected because we have been working since the beginning of this pandemic and the ongoing outbreak as it plays out. Uh, Dr. Jabu, maybe you could jump in and let us know what you've been exposed to in your capacity as a nephrologist, a new word that I've just learned and as a hospitalist in Ohio, which is where you're based, I believe. For the audience that doesn't know the terminology, I'm just going to explain what uh, nephrology is. Nephrology is a specialty in which you take care of the kidneys. And we mostly take care of patients who have advanced kidney disease and also who are on uh, dialysis. With this COVID, it has affected a lot of our patient population because they have other diseases that, are, um, that put them at risk, which includes uh, high blood pressure, diabetes, and heart disease. And they're the most vulnerable because when they do get these infections, they have a higher chance of them having a severe infection and a higher chance of them passing away from this infection. So what the companies, the dialysis companies that run the dialysis units, what they have done is that they have instituted um, safety precautions in which they make sure that the staff wears protective equipment, the patients wear masks every time they come to the dialysis unit. And every day, any patient comes to the dialysis unit, they get their temperatures checked to make sure that they don't have a fever. If they do go to the hospital, we make sure that they get tested before they come back into the, uh, into the dialysis population to protect them. But what we have seen is a lot of our patients who do come to the hospital are very, 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 very sick. Some, a good portion of them may not make it. Then we do get some patients who are likely asymptomatic and they're able to go back into the community. I've also been working in internal medicine in the hospital and we've taken care of a great number of uh, COVID patients. There have been some severe cases we've seen where you know patients, when they come in, they're very, they're very, very, very sick. And when they come in through the door, just by looking at them and looking at numbers, they don't make it. But then I've also been getting a lot of successful patients who've gone on the floor, even despite their age, despite the other medical problems, they've been really doing well. And some of them, they've been doing well with despite the other medical issues. And some of them have actually survived without needing much medications. It's been a very a wide spectrum of patients who are learning new things every day. Right now, it seems like, you know, we don't really have a grasp on a lot of the characteristics of, uh, because we really don't have uh, definitive answers. Our hope right now is this, this drug that's come out called um, 
Remdesivir, we're hoping that could be a game changer, especially in our population. So hopefully over the next few weeks, you know, we may have more data and answers to help guide us in our treatment for these uh, patients. Okay. That's pretty much I have to share so far. And Dr. Jerry, I suppose you would be an escalation point working in critical care. Within that critical care space, I would imagine that the narrative is quite different. You're getting the guys who are literally on their knees with COVID-19. Just If you were to educate your colleagues in Zimbabwe who perhaps haven't been exposed to extreme cases of COVID, what would your key messages be to them? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I would say, yes, I'm at that escalation point. So my specialties are pulmonary, so lung disease and critical care medicine, which is uh, taking care of patients in the uh, medical ICU. My experience has been a little bit different in that on the front end, we got, we, we do get the sickest patients in the hospital, but this was more sick patients than one would expect at any one period in time. I work at an academic center, which is a big university hospital system. We have a lot of physicians to back up for that uh, academic hospital system. So I was somewhat surplus for our academic center, but there were some community hospitals, which we partner with, that typically don't have intensive care doctors. Uh, they have ICUs, but it's typically patients that aren't that sick. Uh, but unfortunately, with COVID-19, those ICUs filled up, so they needed intensivists. Uh, me being a relatively junior person in uh, my practice, I was sent out to one of those. And yeah, it's, it's been a very different experience. The first thing I would say in terms of people getting prepared is on the front end, once you start seeing those critically ill patients, that first week was probably the most difficult week. Why? Because the super sick people who are going to die will die during that first week. Uh, there's very few successes uh, and it's really people dying. Um, I, I'm an ICU doctor, we see people die all the time. Our mortality rates in the ICU are very high, but this was like nothing I had seen before. So uh, I think that really struck me and struck our staff also because morale wasn't great to begin with, mm -hmm. to be quite honest with you, just because it's so difficult seeing that many people die and that many sick people and you can't really do anything about it except give good critical care. That's the second thing is there have been many anecdotes um, and this is a little bit more uh, specialized for the physicians out there. Anecdotes as to uh, high PEEP and then high tidal volumes, people who have compliant lungs, etc. For the physicians out there, all of those anecdotes really, we didn't try any of them, but the literature actually shows that they don't work anyway. What works is good, what we know, good critical care, which is low tidal volume for people who have ARDS who are intubated. The other beauty is you don't have to intubate people early, so you can manage these people with non-invasive ventilation, BiPAPs if they're available, high flow nasal cannula if available, and you can work up your oxygen up to 15 liters and actually tide these people over without needing intubation. So these are some of the things that we've instituted that may potentially be more practical back home thinking about COVID. So you talk about the technical aspects. We, you know, as laymen, we've heard anecdotes about taking a blow dryer and, you know, blowing hot air up your nasal cavity to try and kill COVID-19. And I think it's quite horrifying to hear some of these accounts. Um, perhaps I could have Dr. Fari talk us through your views on, on people just kind of taking care to seek the right solutions for fighting COVID-19. Yes, thank you. Um, so I am a general surgery resident in California. Um, and our experience here in California has been different because our numbers have been low in our hospitals. And so we have focused on trying to decrease the spread of the virus within the hospital and in the community coming from the hospital. And as I've been talking with friends and family members and trying to give them information um, regarding how to protect themselves from the virus, it's been apparent that sources of information are not easily accessible to them. And so this has sort of been what we've been doing just to give people um, access to the information sources like WHO. In the U.S., we rely a lot on the CDC um, to provide people who are not necessarily in the medical community um, with information that they can digest and that they can apply in their daily lives. And I think the message has been pretty clear and very consistent from these uh, resources. You know, it's very important for people to wash their hands very regularly since COVID-19 is um, spread by contact. 
It is also spread by droplets. And so there um, have been encouragements to use masks, surgical mask preferably, um, and N95 masks if you are in the vicinity of a patient who does have COVID. This would mostly be applicable to patients who are in the healthcare field. So for people out in the community, wearing masks, cloth masks or surgical masks is highly encouraged. Um, avoiding um, touching the face and cleaning surfaces such as uh, you know, doorknobs that are that people constantly come into contact with um, is very helpful. Um, social distancing um, is also a very uh, key aspect of trying to decrease the spread um, because people are isolated. Um, and if you're isolated, then um, the idea is that you wouldn't come into contact with people who have the virus. Additionally, if you do have the virus, this would prevent you from spreading um, that virus to other people who are otherwise uninfected. Dr. Bona, as an ER doctor in New York, which is at the helm of contagion in the US. What are your responses to this constitutional debate that's going on in the US at the moment? So people feeling that their rights are being infringed by being told that they need to wear masks, where you see the impact of people not doing that. Right. So, you know, I definitely am a big proponent of social distancing and definitely uh, masks for all when you leave your home. Um, regardless of, and I, I, I don't think it's an infringement if we allow you to go out into the world and just let, you know, ask for you to wear a mask. I think in New York City, currently we're still shut down. Non-essential businesses are still closed. Uh, but just this morning, I was just watching uh, our mayor as well as Governor Cuomo giving a report on the numbers. And, you know, the last two months, like um, Dr. Jerry was saying, were terrible. Like it was the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I'm an emergency doctor, like when they first come in the door, like he was saying, we're used to seeing death, but you've never seen death like this. You know, people come in and they're dying. Dr. Jebu's patients are the sickest types of patients that we usually see. When I see a dialysis patient ro roll in the door, I'm fearing that, you know, this, those are the most likely patients to die. So I think, you know, the people that are demanding for a lot, a lot of these things to be stopped, are they don't really grasp really what's going on i think social distancing is sort of a i don't want to say a luxury it's it's a benefit you know we're actually really lucky to be able to social distance um because there's places where people need to make their daily bread every single day right like you need to get out and make your money that day so social distancing is something that you actually can't do We've seen the benefits of social distancing in New York. We went from having any, close to almost 6,000 deaths a day to today, the death toll was 233. And in places that have not locked down their, their, their numbers, we're actually seeing that the, the cases are still going up. So today, what's today is May 6th. I think the total number of death cases in the, in the country is about 1.2 million, I think, if I'm correct. And half of those cases were all in New York City. Our numbers are actually going down, but everywhere else in the country, they're going up. So it actually vindicates what New York City has been doing, that social distancing works and wearing masks work. So I think people's rights are important, but it's also important for the government and you know, healthcare workers to protect the rest of the community. So if you wanna go out, go out by yourself and risk yourself, but the problem is you're risking everybody else by not adhering to what needs to happen. And how do you think this translates to a Zimbabwean context? So in the Zimbabwean context, which, I've actually been reading that the lockdown is starting to be relaxed. Uh, you know, I think it's hard, especially with the informal market that we have in Zimbabwe to impose social distancing. The best that we can do at this point, since the country is already being unlocked, I guess, is to ensure that everybody has masks. I've received emails from reporters, uh, you know, curious people that are telling me about, can I wash a mask and reuse it? Um, what are my risks with that? And I think as long as everybody wears a mask when you go out, if you don't have to be out, stay home. Even if it's a mask that you make on your own with like some fabric that you find somewhere around the house, a bandana or a surgeon general even demonstrated how to just wrap a scarf around your mask, some type of barrier between your nose, mouth, and sort of the outside air and hand washing like Dr. Fari was saying, those things could help with decreasing the numbers. At this point, we're at a, like a prevention stage. I think Zimbabwe needs prevention more than treatment, which Dr. Jerry just mentioned. Treatment doesn't really exist anywhere in the world right now successfully. 
So preventing things getting out of control is the best chance that we have. But yeah, thank you so much, guys, for coming on Zoom and Zim. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you all. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you guys made it. So awesome to see you guys. <laughs> Take Bye, care. guys. Bye-bye. Thanks, Mucha. We appreciate it.